What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button because we promise not to disappoint you. Today, we got a guest on, man, that I spent some time at with USP Big Sandy. I like to bring these brothers on because we were at one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous prison at that time. So anyway, brother, I'm going to let you tell the people who you are, tell them where you're from, and we're going to talk about you and how you ended up in Big Sandy and some of the things that you experienced. How you doing? Joe Horvath, I'm from a small town on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio, called Painesville. And uh, I was I was just like the typical kid growing up in the 90s, you know, making a couple extra blocks, you know, thinking I was uh, running that, what, what do they say, the street life or that cool, you know, hustler, hustler mentality. And uh, to be totally honest with you, when I caught my first <coughs> case, it, 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 it scared the shit out of me because, you know, the paperwork said um, the state or United States of America versus and it says all your names. And then they, they got that big eagle on the uh, wall. It, it definitely it's a reality check when you walk in that courtroom. I'll tell you that. <laughs> How old were you when you caught your Fed case, brother? Twenty three, twenty four, twenty three, twenty four years old. You don't have a lot of time. How much time do people? How much time you get sentenced to? I got sentenced to twenty two months for seven twenty dollar bills of counterfeit money. And they don't send you to a nice prison. They probably send you to the most dangerous federal prison at that time, right? They, they, they. I had seventeen months left, and they sent me to USP Big Sandy. <laughs> USP Big Sandy, man, young kid, seventeen months, and they send you to really a place where it's. Kill or be killed, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, when I got when I got to Big Sandy, they took me into the uh, office. The guy looked at my paperwork. He said, "You don't got any five K one. You don't have this. You this this." He's like, he's like, here, and he gave me like four pieces of paper, and he said, "You can get the rest from your case manager in the morning." He's like, "You'll be good on the yard. Go out there." And then he sent me to to the orientation in the chapel and uh, Warden Rios. I'll never forget it. Warden Rios, he uh, he came in front of everybody. He said, if you're white, stay with the whites. If you're blood, be a blood. If you're a crip, be a crip. And he said, if you gamble, pay your debts. If you get high, pay for what you get high on. If you come to my office and try to check in, I'm going to send you back out there to get what you're looking for. And then he said, have a nice day. And he walked away. <laughs> Rios was definitely, you know, the type of warden that didn't play no games, right? No, he, no. <laughs> what was going through your young mind, bro, when they sent you to USP Big Sandy? Had you heard the stories? Were you like, damn, bro, I'm going to this place? Well, well, I was, um, I had a pretty good reputation from my neighborhood. So, uh, and I had traveled a little bit, you know, to a couple of different neighboring uh, states. So, um, when I caught my Fed case, I thought I was going to be cool. I didn't really, I wasn't, I wasn't nervous. And I got to Oklahoma and I was, you know, how you come out, when you come out of Oklahoma, your first night there, or second night there, they got a big, uh, big wall with your name on it, tells you where you're going. And uh, it told me I was going to USP Big Sandy and this big Hispanic guy tattoos all over his face. He's one of the MS-13s or something, you know, big guy. You could tell he was like a real convict. Like he was, he was National Geographic poster child for like the prison guy, you know? And uh, he's a real big guy, way bigger than I was. And he looked at me and goes, you don't want to go to Big Sandy. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, what, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> so did he kind of tell you what was going on over there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did. So were you, were you, I mean, keep it real. Were you scared getting there? Hell yeah, I was scared. And then when the cops told me, you'll be all right out there. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> what do you mean I'll be all right out there? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I, I stayed up my first night 100% staring at the yard from B2. And uh, I was like, yeah, I don't know about this. You know, I only got 17 months left. I'm like, you know, I can do that in the hall. <laughs> you know, I, I, but then I started thinking about it and I was like, I was like, well, maybe I could just go check it out and see how it is, you know. Let's see what these homeboys they're talking about are. And so I got, I got up, went to breakfast, you know. I did what they told me to do. I had my boots on, the door popped, 
they were, you know, I went down to the breakfast and uh, I met Justin and uh, Trago and all those guys. And, um, you know, to be honest, they, they did. They embraced me. They embraced me very well. And, the Ohio car at that time was pretty much, you got, you had a good group of guys over there, man. Yeah, Big J, Justin, yeah. you, you guys had some good dudes, well, but. I think uh, you had Doug on your show. What did you say? I think you had Doug on your show. Yeah, I did have Doug on. Yep, you remember Doug? Another good, another good white guy, you know, from Ohio. He was solid. Let me ask you this, though. When do you meet Ace? I meet Ace when he comes back from court. Uh, probably about a, a month, maybe three weeks into my into, into my time in Big Sandy. I, had, I was there. And uh, he comes back and he introduces himself and Basically, lets me know that he's he's like the go-to guy, you know. But but we're not a gang, though. We're not a gang, you know. <laughs> but but we have to do certain things to go with the politics of the situation that we're living in, you know. I want to talk about that a little bit, Joe. For those that don't know who Ace is, I talk about him in the book. He's the dude that I got into it with. Um, him, Trago. You actually sent me a picture, which I'll probably use for the thumbnail. Has Trago on there. But I want to talk a little bit about Ace, right? Eventually he gets shot from the gun tower and he loses his life at USP Big Sandy. What was, you know, when he when he tells you, and that, you know, this is what this is going to be more about today is the independence. And you know, you're like, we're not a gang. Tell us about the independence, man. Tell the people about the independence. Okay, so, <clears throat> so in federal prison, um, there's there's certain rules that you just you follow. You don't enter race sharing cells unless you're a specific black gang person that is white or I, I don't I don't understand that part. But that there's people out there that are like that, and um, they you you don't eat at certain child tables. <clears throat> you know there's just certain rules. So. I guess the way it was the way it was taught to me was if a white guy does something instead of the black guy and the white guy getting into it, which would cause all the white guys and all the black guys to get into it, his own kind, the white guy would take care of whatever the white guy did wrong and vice versa or whatever. Well, the, the white gang members, the way I was told, were were basically extorting a lot of the white dudes that didn't want to be gang members so they started a group like independent like nine gang people but they were still going with the penitentiary politics is the best way i could describe it so really you know when they when they make you know they i explain this in the book so when you get there and say look man you know i'm ace man i'm you know i'm i'm the shot caller but we're not a gang did you right. feel like the independent white dudes were a gang absolutely not yeah, for sure. We were definitely, we were definitely 100% one strong ass gang in Big Sandy. <laughs> we, I mean, we were 22, we were 22 white dudes from the same state. We, uh, we definitely acted like a gang, 100%. <laughs> and then you were there when Stevie Burke shows up, right, from Boston? Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. And all everything started changing, and everything started getting real wild, real quick. <laughs> Worse so than it already was. <laughs> So Stevie Burke shows up, and now the independents, all the white guys are kind of like, you know what, we're going to all come together. The Ohio car, the Boston car, the New York guys, we're all going to kind of be our own gang, right? Yeah, and that was that was the talks of the whole summer right before I left, like literally right before I left. Were you there when we had the big meeting with all the white gang members and all the independents? On the, uh, no. You weren't there for that? No, that I, I, it, was that was that right before you and Ace got into it? Probably about three or four weeks before that, yeah. Yeah, that's. I think I was there for the when everybody met on the yard and talked whatever they talked about, but I didn't go out there and I. I wasn't. Uh, I was too close to the door, you know. As a matter of fact, I think I was in the hall. I I went to the hall. Uh, so what what happened? We were. I can't remember. We were we were drinking or something, and, and some shit happened. We got into it with somebody, and something happened. I can't remember right now because I'm drawing a blank. But I was in the hole. I was in that that step down C two or C four or whatever that. It was like the hole, but not the hole. It was the step down program. Yeah, I was in that in that thing for freaking. 
I don't remember. It was a couple of weeks. I was in there for a couple of weeks. That's all right. And, let me uh, let's talk about this, right? You have a homeboy, and he's in the thumbnail, and I liked him, Jimmy. I think his name was Jimmy. Yeah. And Jimmy, you know, he's out there selling cigarettes and doing his thing. And there's an armed gang member, right? Arm. I think it's yeah. Aryan Resistance Militia or something mm -hmm. like that. So you got Danny, right? Danny's an armed gang member. My, Danny was in my unit. Danny was in B2 with me. So Danny wants to take advantage of Jimmy. He's trying to extort him and take his shit, right? Yeah, pretty much. I want to know why the Ohio dudes didn't retaliate against Danny, bro. What happened? This, this, this is this is what the the true story. This is this is how this is how the 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 true the true story was prior prior to Jimmy checking in. Doug was getting his little hustle on, which was the one that resembles Jimmy very well in that picture. Doug. Yeah was doing that and he wanted Danny to give him something and Danny hadn't paid for it. Well, one of the black dudes from Ohio came up and got something and Danny made it a, a racial thing. Well, Doug wasn't wrong. Me, Ace, Trago, Justin, Jimmy, the one in the picture, all of us had met that morning and literally we were about to go to town on Danny and all of them right there on the yard and Doug didn't come outside. He, said he got scared and stayed in his cell. So when we came back in, Ace and Jake talked, and then Trago said, come on. And me and Trago and Jimmy had to go put the put the whooping on, on Dougie and walk him to the lieutenant's office. Didn't then, uh, did, did Jimmy end up did Jimmy end up checking in? Yes. And then a few weeks later, Danny started doing the same thing. And then Jimmy was like, this and another, I'm not. And he came and said some shit to me and Ace on the yard one day while we were watching softball. And uh, the next thing you know, he was he was gone. He checked in. Crazy, right? When someone checks and it, in. And, it's, and it, that kind of shit, like you can't really describe that when you're hanging out with somebody all day and you're like building a bond with them. And then because some dude pulls a card on you, you know what I'm saying? Like now, now you got to put your, you know, it, it, it just, it, it sucks, man. What do you think about, you know, in, in, just in general, right? What do you think about white dudes that do shit like that to other white dudes? Like put you in a position because I heard that Danny had pulled the knife out on him and that's what scared him. It spooked him and he took off. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure he probably did. I'm sure he did pull one out on him. He pulled one out on people every night in B2 and was drinking and, and messed up. I mean, he had one called Bertha that, dude, I thought I thought they made it on that show Forge. I mean, it was that good. <laughs> Seen some wild knives in there, right? Man, that, that was my first job as being a part of the Ohio car was to get a job in the maintenance. Ace made sure I got a job, and then I got, like, three sheets of plexiglass, and that's what we did. So, yeah. Let me ask you this. Did you keep a knife on you at all times? No, not at all times. But, yeah, I, I, I kept one on me when I got the heads up about shit. I mean, did you have one in close vicinity whenever you, yeah. you might have needed it? Yeah, I had one at all. Yeah, yeah there, was one, there was one at any given time within, within a step or two from what was going on. Yeah, for sure. So you get to Big Sandy. I know Ace shows up a month later from court and – you know, he's giving you the rundown about being a shot caller and all of that type of shit. Yeah. You know, and, and make no mistakes about it, man. Ace wasn't a punk. I don't want anyone to think that he was a punk because no. he wasn't. I mean, he, he would punch you in the face. He'd stab you. But no, in he, was, he, was, he, he was a uh, – Ace, I, I'm going to be honest. He was a, he, he a stand-up dude for what he believed in with what he was doing. But he had alternative motives because he was a very selfish and – you got to remember that man was uh, like an adrenaline jump. Like nothing was ever going to be enough for him. You know what I mean? Like he wanted more and more and more like extreme. You know what I mean? Like he had, he had ego problems. Let me ask you this, you know, cause I talk about this, you know, on some of the videos in my book, do you feel like dudes like Ace that got forever that are never getting out people like him and Stevie Burke, do you feel like that's all they got left is that they want to be the boss cause they have yeah. nothing else left in life? Absolutely. Yeah. There was, I when when I found out that he got shot and, and, and killed by the guard, 
I was the only thing that surprised me was how soon he did what did that because every day he saw that red helicopter land on that on that prison. He said, "That's my ride home." He said, "That's the only way I'm ever going to leave this place." And he knew that's what he was going to do. You know, I, I'm surprised he did it so early. To be honest, I thought he would have waited till he got older, but I I believe with full intentions that he knew what he was doing when he did it. Do you think that was because he wanted to escape the pain of never getting out of prison? For sure. I mean, yeah, 248 years, or and and, and and he was a hothead, you know. He he had he had a big ego. I mean, that's it, just the honest, yeah, truth about the guy. You know, since I've been out of prison, I've spoken to his dad through messages on Facebook, and his father seen the videos, and we right. talked. I kind of wanted to try to bring his dad on. He was reluctant, yeah. but. You know, listen, I don't think Ace was a bad dude. I think that prison destroyed him. I think that having, you know, 248 years destroyed him. Yeah. And eventually what he didn't realize is that the law would change, and it did change. And Ace right. would have had a chance to get out of prison, right? Just like I had the same charges as him. He could have eventually yeah, yeah. possibly got out of prison, but he lost his life out there on the yard and never got to see the law change or materialize, man. Yeah. I was uh, I was very, I was very fortunate. I was very blessed, I think. I think somebody up there was looking out for me because my my time in Big Sandy was a was a maturing process. It was an eye opener, and uh, it gave me uh, like a real true reality. You know, when I when I when I came home from when I came home from Big Sandy, it it felt like I came home like like from Iraq. To be honest with you, I, I felt like I had came came from overseas or like Desert Storm. Let me ask you this, being a young man, going to Big Sandy with all that time, right, and some of the things that you've seen, do you feel like that affected you mentally, emotionally? Did it did it affect your life when you did get out of prison in any way? Um, yeah, yeah, in in a lot of ways. It uh it made me made me a lot more mature. It made it made me look at uh it made me hold a hold a more uh, I don't know more more value to freedom, more value to uh, to, to to things that I had had took a lot of advantage of, you know, or, or took for granted is, is the right word. I I took a lot of took the took, took granted took took for granted a lot of things, you know. But yeah, when you're in a place like that, it doesn't matter if you're there for a month or if you're there for twenty years. When you walk through gates to go in the door, and you hear gravel shuffle. And the first couple of times you look and you see somebody getting poked or 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 physically assaulted, like with all intentions to kill them, it, it definitely makes you nervous and it makes you value your life when you get out of that situation for sure. <laughs> you know, you talked about Ace being selfish, right? He had his own motives, right? Do you feel like he would have sent you on a mission even though you had only 17 months? Do you feel like he would have sent you on a dangerous mission? No, he 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 had me do in-house stuff as far as like when someone in the cell needed to get punched on or or something like that or or you had to sneak this from one side of the yard to the other. Oh yeah, you're going you're going you're going to get down with that. But as far as going to stab somebody, no, he never. He actually I was I was going to go do something one time and he told he said no that my time was too long and that if it would escalate into something worse, that he didn't want me to have more time. He actually was pretty solid about that. I don't know if that was an isolated situation, but that was that was my experience. No, he struck me as that type of dude. You know, people watching the show don't realize, you know, when you're like, well, you know, I had to go in a cell and punch on someone. You know, give us an example of something you had to do. Well, that, that was what I was talking about earlier as far as, like, with Doug. You know, we, we all went outside already aware of what was going on and we're ready to stand our ground and stick up for our our buddy that's in our car and uh when he didn't come out because i guess he was fearful for what would happen or how it would go down maybe he didn't trust us maybe he didn't believe that they were that we would all stand behind him i i really didn't, ain't sure what the guy maybe he was paranoid i don't know but the fact that he didn't come outside Danny and all those guys and 
uh, they they use that as like, well, that's admission admission of guilt. That, that she's yeah. not even knows he's wrong. And and, and then we gotta choose. Do we all say fuck you? And I mean, sorry, I apologize. Do we all say say forget you and go to war with you because we don't like you anyways? Or do we save face and we go hit Doug a couple times and walk him to the lieutenant's office? So I mean, let me ask you this though, Doug. When he goes to the lieutenant's office, does he come back to population, or he he yeah. transfers and then goes back to Big Sandy later when everybody's gone? Do you know that? No, it's a different Doug. Different Doug. Okay, I thought that was the Doug. All right. No, no, different Doug. Different Doug. Yeah. So let me ask you this, right? I was thinking it was Jimmy. I, it's been many years. Yeah, Jim, Jimmy checked in. Yeah. Jimmy checked in. Let me ask you this, though. You lived around Danny, right? Like I said, he was an armed gang member. Eventually, later, it would come out that he had ran on one of his homeboys in Pollock, and his own brother smashed him in the SMU program. They got him pretty bad, bro. They almost, I think they almost killed him. And eventually, I would see him later on in another prison and talk to him, and he kind of simmered down. But he was a troublemaker, bro. He was always drunk. You know, he talked that, you know, white pride shit. And, mm -hmm. But he was all, but, but honestly, he would victimize other white dudes, right? Absolutely. He was, to me, the exact reason why I was so gun ho to run with Ace and those guys in that, that so-called independent man game. You know, because I was like, I could never let that guy act the way he acts to. Because he was like that. Even with, with some of his other gang members or other gang members that were in different white gangs, you know, they'd be in the rooms drinking together, and Danny was always, I mean, he was just a menace, man. He really was, and I hate to talk bad about him, but that's just the truth. That's the facts. I mean, I, I think he might, if he if he, if he's solid, he'll tell the truth. Back then, he was, he was a menace. Let me ask yeah. you this, because there's been plenty of times, man, where I laid in my cell and thought about, man, you know what? I'd like to do something to this dude, man, and you know what? I, I, I'm really thinking, contemplating, man, like doing something really bad to someone. And I didn't live in a unit with him, but were there times where you, you might have laid in your bed and thought, man, you know what, man, we should just get rid of this dude, like put his lights out? Um, there was there were several times where I asked some other guys in there that had some high-ranking uh, positions, you know, why do you guys let this dude do that, you know? And they would, they would give me the roundabout BS reasons, and, you know, but like you said, it eventually his own people took him out which is which is what i would like to to really say because this is what i tell my own kids i got teenage boys right now i say hey if you listen to every one of those stories about guys that joined these gangs in prison and, and did this tough guy fair bid if you listen every one of those stories ends up with their own people smashing them. You know what I mean? I mean, it's real and it's raw, man. That's the reality of what really happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's just what it is. And, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Even though the independents were considered, you know, by a lot of people as, oh, man. Like, the gang members eventually hated the independents. They're like, because we, you know, you know, the independents had the numbers, right? Yeah. So, eventually, yeah. they're like, we hate these dudes because they became, have become the strongest white gang in the prison system. Yes. yes. Especially a big sandy. I mean, Big Sandy was, yeah, that was, it was the only federal prison I went to, but, but like I said, I, I, I have a lot of, a lot, I have a lot of friends and, and I know a lot of people have been a lot of places and, and they said Big Sandy was Big Sandy. There was, there was no comparison to Big Sandy. <laughs> Were there ever times you thought you might never make it out of prison? Absolutely. Yeah, regularly. Yeah, for sure. And I know you had a celly, right? That he, you know, he spent. Up. I mean, he's got. Yeah. Talk about your celly. You tell the people who he is. Well, my my celly, I was I, I was actually blessed to uh, ask this old Italian guy if he needed something to drink while I was at the pop machine one day, and he ended up taking a liking to me and moving me into his cell. And his name's uh, Vic Amuso, and uh, he's the 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 man. Uh, he he got locked up with John Gotti back in 1990. And when I tell you that was the best, I used to look forward to lockdowns. I really did because Vic was a hilarious, hilarious old school gangster. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about Vic, Vic Amuso, right? What was he like? What was it like living with Vic? Vic, Vic was awesome. 
Vic, Vic bought me a Ben and Jerry's ice cream every Thursday for uh, 14 months straight, man. <laughs> Vic was, Vic called me Sloppy Joe. He said, he said, you know, you, I call you Sloppy Joe, Joe, because you don't, you never, you never keep everything clean. You're like my grandson. You're like my grandson. You don't, you don't clean nothing. <laughs> But he was a he was a great guy, man. He, he would tell me stories, you know. He would tell me stories, and uh, you know, he wouldn't tell me he wouldn't tell me the stories that they make movies about. He would tell me the real stories, you know. Like he told me a story about a a, a guy that that he knew from his neighborhood that was a real tight ass with money. So he told him that he got this new Cadillac with this special carburetor and all this stuff and so he said he kept sneaking in the guy's driveway at night and putting gas in his car after he would drive it all day so the guy would think that the car was great on gas <laughs> and uh you know just to hear a guy like Vic Amuso tell me a story like that bro is, is memorable you know what I mean because here's this guy that they make documentaries about for being a cold heartless killer and the whole time he's buying me ice cream and telling me telling me little funny stories about growing up and stuff, you know? Vic, Vic was a great old man, and I got I got a lot of love and respect for that old guy. <laughs> I, I mean, I was with him at Big Sandy. I was with him at Coleman. He, uh, I was there when someone actually assaulted him, bro. And another, oh. and a, yeah, and, and another dude just, just uh, old hillbilly dude from Tennessee just absolutely destroyed yeah. the dude that hit Vic, bro. Yeah, I would I would have done the same instantly. Who do you think was the most dangerous group, man, when you were at USP Big Sandy? Um, the most dangerous group would have to be the, the Hispanic, those Texas, uh, uh, Hispanic Mexican Mafia. Is that what they're called? Were you talking about the South Siders or are you talking about the Texas? The Texas? real Texas, the real, or the, is it Texas Emmy or Mexican Mafia Emmy or something? I, I really don't want to say it the wrong way because I, I don't want nobody knocking on my door. But those guys are the real deal, man. I was actually a good friend with a with a kid that was half white and half Hispanic. His name was uh, David Rivas. He was in B2 with me. They called him Dirty D, and he did the tattoos and stuff. And the kid could never be made into their gang, but those guys, yeah, man, those guys, there's no slack with those guys. Those are, they're right now. Yeah, you might have them confused with the Texas Emmy because there wasn't that many of them over there. But I think you might have been in the step down program when they stabbed Emmett, when his own people stabbed him out there in that little, you know, that little rec yard that they you guys would go in out in front of the building. Yeah, in front of the basketball hoop. Yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah, I I, I seen that guy get stabbed, and then I saw the uh, I was I was actually getting ready to leave. We went and had breakfast. And I came back, changed into my joggers, went out on the yard to hit my my little workout routine. And uh, and Harwood told me, he said, Joe, stay stay on the track side. Don't go on the handball side. And I said, okay. And, and anytime somebody with his knowledge would tell me something, I would listen. So I went on the track side and I was doing my push-ups. And, and those, uh, those guys, they were doing their workout and they – Okay, one homeboy dropped down to do his burpees, and the rest of them just hit him like pit bulls. And I think you said his name earlier when we were conversating. And uh, man, I, I I said that that old man. I don't know how he walked. I don't know how he got up and walked. That was that was the most vicious vicious beating I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I don't know how his face was still on his head. I mean, the, the people you're talking about was some white supremacist group, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the white supremacist guys shows up. There's a beef in between their own gang, and he's an old man, and they just demolish him. I'm talking about with no mercy. I mean, at my at my age now, it, it, it gives me a feeling in my stomach. You know what I mean? That to, to see somebody punished like that over probably some BS, it, it, it's that serious. Let me ask like, you this. The person you're talking about, I know who he is. I know his name. I know what gang he was in. Right. We're not, we don't have to man. We'll just say it was a white supremacist gang, right? White right. group. This old man they're beating up, he's old enough to be your father, bro, right? Yeah. What does yeah, it feel yeah. like for you to see an old white dude like that getting beat up by kids our age? I just, at the time, 
I was like better him than me. But but looking looking back, looking back, it was vicious, you know. But 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 in all honesty, at that moment in Big Sandy in that zone with learning to make moonshine and, and gambling at the poker table and getting tattoos and and running around like a young guy and it pretty much like like you know just an idiot for real at the time and then the lockdowns came and the and, and you know the 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 more violence you saw the more real it got and the more the more you learned to carry yourself maturely you know Chad, I wouldn't, I wouldn't walk past you without saying the word "excuse me." Regardless, even if you weren't paying me no attention, it, it, it became habit. I, I would say the word "excuse me" more than anything ever in life. Joe, let me tell you something, Joe. Prison teaches you to do that stuff. I do that everywhere I go. I tell people, like my wife's, like thinks I'm country because I say stuff like "appreciate you." You know what I mean? Excuse yeah. me. Thank you. I mean, I'm very, and that comes from years of being in prison. If I spill something in the microwave at home, I don't leave it for later. I clean it up. Yeah. Why wait till later? <laughs> I mean, we, we've been through some, you know, we've been through some dangerous places. And, you know, there's dudes that don't realize. They think, man, they catch a little counterfeit in charge or whatever, 23 yeah. years old. Man, they ain't going nowhere serious. You ended up in the most dangerous prison. I don't care what anyone says. You were the most dangerous federal prison in the country at 23 years old, right? And I asked you earlier, Joe, I said, man, does it affect you, man? Did it affect you when you got out? Were you able to sleep at night? Did you sleep with a weapon? How was your life like when you got out and you tried to go to bed at night? Um, sleep, sleep was, sleep's always been hard for me, even, even before Big Sandy. But yes, sleep is like four hours. If you get, if you get four solid hours without hearing the noise and waking you up, you did good. I have, I have, uh, I have like, I have a problem with noise, like gravel. Mm -hmm. If I hear gravel shuffle, my instant reaction is like I, I get a little tense and, and I get tightened up. I, um, I pay attention to people's body language a lot. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot of, a lot of learned habits. You know, it's a lot of learned habits from being incarcerated and, and being in situations where. If you didn't see that man turn or you didn't catch that look on his face, you would probably be on the wrong end of whatever happened. <laughs> you know, so it makes you very aware of things that you wouldn't be aware of unless you're in that situation. That's what I have to say. Let me ask you this, right? Because sometimes, man, I just have I just feel like sometimes I get like flashbacks. Sometimes I can see violence and I think of the things that I seen in prison. Like it takes me there, bro. Like emotionally and mentally like i'm there for the moment right do you ever feel that way man yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah um it it's it takes a lot like i i i I've, um i've had a lot of life life experiences since since prison so i've done counseling and therapy so i got a little bit of knowledge with myself in the way i would i actually thought i was crazy for a while and talked to a <laughs> therapist and my therapist and counselor, or whatever you call them. Well, Joe, let me stop you for a second, Joe. You still look crazy as hell, bro. I'm just joking, man. <laughs> Thank you. No, honestly, though, but they said that your thinking for being in that type of environment or, or lifestyle growing up, that your thinking is very rational and normal, and, and, and I actually – it started developing like a lot better people skills and, and, and more confidence from getting that clarification about that because you you could honestly start questioning yourself and and thinking that you're institutionalized or that you're you know you're crazy or weird because you're paying attention or you don't want to sit with your with people behind you you want your back to the wall or or something along those lines you know what I mean and you develop those type of habits, you know, from being incarcerated. You ever go into Walmart or maybe a post office, a restaurant, and feel like people are watching you or like you got to watch them and make sure nothing happens? You know, what's funny is just just a, a few nights ago, my, my seven-year-old stepson was sick and uh, I had to run to Walgreens and get him some kids Tylenol or something like that. 
And when I pulled into Walgreens, it's about 11.30 at night, and um, a kid came running out of the store. Like, he stole something, jumped in a car, took off, like, speeding. And, and I circled the parking lot twice, and, and my other older teenage son, he said, you gonna, you gonna park or you gonna circle? Why are you circling around? I said, well, that guy just ran out of there. I don't know if we should go in there, buddy. They might have just robbed that place or something. You know, because <laughs> I don't know what's going on, and I'm nervous, you know. <laughs> Joe, you've been through a lot of things, man. You've seen some things, and you didn't have that much time, but you're definitely in a dangerous place, man. What are you doing now? What are you doing with your life, man? I, uh, now I'm uh, I'm with I'm with the, uh, the the love of my life uh, for going on six years now. Um, between the two of us, we got eight beautiful kids. Uh, yeah, um, I build big big uh, big trailers, big big transfer trailers, uh, industrial dump trailers. You know, big big semi trailer type things. And uh, I just work and I try to help out. Mostly I try to help out with like younger dudes in the community if they need a job or something, you know, things like that. I, I, I just I just try to do what they say the, the next the next best thing or to pay it for you know, just try pay to it do forward. That. Do the next you know, you yeah. pay it forward to people. Let me ask you this, Joe. When you go to work every day, right? Yeah. Do you appreciate it? I love it. I love it. I love working. Um I love having a family. You know what I mean? I'm coming home to my woman and, and my kids, and like that stuff's very important, man. When you when you lay in a room at night and you don't know when they're gonna open the door and let you out for a shower, or you're counting your noodles and cutting your sausage into three so that way you can make three different meals because you don't know when you're going to the store because yeah. these guys might not let you out for another three weeks. When you when you come home you 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 value it. Uh, I told I got a I got I got like I said I got some teenage boys and they've been they they had to go 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 to the juvenile place for about a week or two here and there, and uh, I tell them I tell them like you know that's just that's just the beginning, and and they they straightened up they're, they're good kids now but they had a little rough time and I'm very I'm trying to think how to say it but. The best thing I can say is you should you should show everybody your show a lot more because the, the facts and the realities of what's presented on this show is very true. And that's that's what the younger people need to see, because like what you say, saving people from premature death and incarceration, that it's that's the only other option. That's all this is gonna do. That's all that's all they got to look forward to. I want, to ask you, I want to ask you one last question before we go, right? Because I want this to hit some people that are watching, man. What was the most loneliest times you ever spent in prison, bro? The loneliest time was probably... I would probably say it would be, be the Christmas. It would probably be the Christmas. The Christmas is... The Christmas is always, always hurt for the worst, you know. Uh, when I was younger, the holidays went by, it wasn't a big deal. But then I had went home and, and I had to go back to the state and I was a little bit older. And that, that, was, that was a lot harder on the heart and the conscience. And uh, I, just, I just really, I pray that everybody that, that pays attention to your show or has any type of way, to ever hear a message from anybody, and I hope that they get it without having to experience it. You know, I hope that they can learn from from hearing about it without having to live it. That you know, I think that sums it up. When I, I you know, I would ask you, you know, what message would you give? It? But I think that's the message right there, man. Well, I appreciate it. Chad. I appreciate you having me on your show, man. I, I really applaud you for what you do, man. It's it, it was great because I had always told my kids about Big Sandy and. You know, and, and the difference between that and these Ohio prisons that they think are so tough. And uh, then your show just popped on and we ended up catching it. And and we actually ended up being there at the same time, which is pretty crazy. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, man, that, I, I, I appreciate you, brother. Seriously. Well, listen, man, when we, when, oh, we get, I it so much. <laughs> when we get done with this, I'm going to shoot you a book and an audio book so your kids can listen to the audio book. 
Yeah, I'd love the audio book, and I'd appreciate if you signed the book, because I had already bought the book. I got you booked away. I could use one with the autograph, bro. Okay, did you read Did you read the whole thing or what? Well, I read bits and pieces. Mostly I listened to you read the book on, on the video. Huh. <laughs> it's all good, man. I'm going to send you an autograph book, bro, for sure. Right, Listen, man, I, I definitely appreciate you coming on. I think this was a pretty good interview. You know, prison is real, man. It's not what people make it out to be. Federal prison is a dangerous place. State prison, if you end up in the wrong state, it's a dangerous place. It's a place where you could lose your life. It's a place where you'll be laying in your bunk on Christmas after Christmas, wishing that you were home, wishing that you made a different choice, man. Blood on the Razor Wire TV with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out.